Greenville celebrates Thursday night at 8. I'm Dan Rather, and this is Red Square in the heart of Moscow. Tonight, we want you to share the experience of nine reporters and their production crews inside the Soviet Union. The times seem to be changing here. New words are on everyone's lips. Well, this was a glassness. 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 Which, loosely translated, means openness, candor, self-criticism. And perestroika. 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 Good. Yeah. Restructuring. Economic reform. Tonight, you will see people and places never before shown on American television. It's the first time Western journalists have been on board a Soviet warship of any kind with a camera. You know, a lot of Americans ha have no idea that you have drug problems in the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, that's the fact. This is a society where husbands are banned from the delivery room. But as part of the new openness, the Soviets agreed to give us a rare look inside at the birth of a baby here. There is a new American embassy building. They say the whole thing is a bug. <laughs> Maybe. <Huh? laughs> Yuri and Galya's problems are in the mill. Those big reforms haven't reached them yet. They promised to make changes. Well, they've begun, but it's not enough. Meet Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin, Gorbachev's man in Moscow. Why don't you buy the meat? You consider this meat? It's fat and bones. The concert stage, a front line in Gorbachev's battle for Glasnost. CBS News has gained unprecedented access here. That does not mean total access or total freedom. But what you're about to see represents the most open examination of Soviet life my colleagues and I have ever been allowed to attempt. What is this Glasnos? You be the judge. As for the next two hours, you experience life inside Mikhail Gorbachev's Soviet Union. Seven days in May. Republic of Estonia, the city of talent. And the band is playing an old American march by John Philip Sousa. This is the part of the Soviet Union that is most influenced by the West. It's also the leading edge of Gorbachev's economic reforms. When I first started, I was a pioneer. But now people are coming to ask me how to do it. Meet Gorbachev's hope for a better Soviet Union, Syria Schmidt, a pioneer because Gorbachev's economic reforms allow her to run her own business. She rents the equipment from the state, but beyond that, the profits are hers, and so is her time. What are the benefits of the new system? Before, everything was decided by management. Now I decide my hours for myself. I would never want to go back to the old system now. <laughs> Another pioneer, Peter Podelsky, driving his private cab for profit in his spare time. He's making 50% more money. Mm, it is hard to get a taxi. You have to wait in line. But now that there are private taxis, there are more cars and better service. A few experiments in private enterprise just scratching the surface. We 
we have still to stand in line to get some service. Very often, uh, service quality is very lousy. So Martin Kusk, just another long-suffering uh, Soviet consumer. Uh, a little uneasy about talking to us with the camera on. A few years ago, it wouldn't have been safe talking like this. For instance, I hate standing in lines. Organically, I, I hate it. That's what gave Viktor Rodin the idea of opening up this place. It's been called the Soviet McDonald's. Fast food, no long waiting in line, but instead of serving hamburgers, it's Soviet meat pies. We pay rent to the state for everything you see here. And then what is left, we split up between the workers. Have you ever seen a real McDonald's? McDonald's. Uh, yeah. Just recently, I read about these McDonald's. And as a specialist in the field for a long time, I can imagine how it works. I could imagine it intuitively. I think it is a well thought out organization. But as far as the selection goes, a hamburger is a hamburger. McDonald's. Gorbachev's new Soviet businessman. Profits, better service. <laughs> it sure sounds like capitalism. It sounds like capitalism to the local official in charge of approving these new businesses, too. What's more, he admits it. The main goal is to provide better service. Uh, the means don't really matter. If the means are capitalistic, then we are prepared to use them. It's not important uh, what you call it. It used to matter what you called it. Not long ago, he'd be in Siberia for saying that. Of course, private enterprise has always existed in the Soviet Union, underground, where it's still thriving. The police are looking for me, and if they take me, I have two or three years. We couldn't get his name. We were surprised he'd even talk to us. His business is the black market. Is there anything in the Soviet Union that you can't buy if you have enough money? It sounds like you can buy almost anything. Hopefully, yes, of course. You can buy what you want if you have any money. Anything? Anything. What do you want? A Mercedes. Uh... Please. I only pay for it. Gold, drugs, brilliance, all what you want. How much can you make on a good day here working the black market? 60 and 100 rubles a day. You make 100 rubles in a day? Yeah. When in the factory you would make 200 in a month? Yeah. No wonder you're on the black market. His official job is boy scout instructor. It's too soon, and there are too few of these new businesses to tell if they can improve things. Victor Rudin's customers are happy not to wait in line, but he's the only one in town. If you want fast food, you have to eat Victor's meat pies. As for Syria, her customers are also happy not to have to wait for an appointment. The Laboratory of Private Enterprise. But this place not only doesn't look like the rest of the Soviet Union, it's not typical of the Soviet Union. The attitudes and the values here reflect the days when Estonia was an independent country before World War II. It will be a major indication of Gorbachev's success or failure, not by how well this model does here, but by how well it spreads into the rigid and inefficient heartland of Russia. It's been one of the best kept secrets in the Soviet Union. It was something the government didn't talk about. Certain things, after all, only happened in the decadent world of capitalism. Well, guess what? An apartment robbery. Well, they have taken the jewelry. The earrings, gold, the, uh, chain, necklace, ring, wedding ring too. The practically they have taken everything what the family had. Yes, they have a crime problem here in the Soviet Union. And finally, the authorities are publicly admitting it. 
Major Nodar Gir Gadza is a district police chief in the city of Tbilisi, a thousand miles south of Moscow. While we were at his police station, they brought this man in, a drug addict and suspected drug pusher. When the police caught him, they say, he was carrying this package. What is it? Gas. Coconut. 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 Opium. Opium. Opium? Opium. Coconut. Mac. 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 Opium. Mac. Poppy. Mac. Mac. Nazi. Opium. Mac. It's opium. A poppy. Ashkarat. Ashkarat. Zilier. Kiron. Ebay. Nay. Osulay. Ota. Zakon. Nebri. Ota. Zgan. Ota. Zgan. He says he's been using drugs for 22 years, since he was 15. For years, the Soviet authorities gloated. Drugs were a symptom of the decay of Western values. America and Europe had a monopoly on drug addicts. By the way, if he's convicted only of possession, he faces up to three years in prison. Pushers, however, face up to 15 years behind bars. What we've just seen is by Soviet standards rather remarkable. Not that the Soviet Union has a drug problem, although that's been one of those nasty little secrets the authorities never like to talk about. What's so remarkable is that they actually let us tape the arrest and interrogation, knowing full well we were going to show it to an American audience. You know, a lot of Americans ha have no idea that you have drug problems in the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, that's the fact. We do have a drug problem. I think this is the major problem in my country. And we have to pay attention to the drug problem or else in 10 years or so we will face disaster. What's happening here? We don't have to hide anything from our people. People should know we have a drug problem. We have pushers and we have drug addicts. This is a new beginning, isn't it? I think it's not a new beginning, but it's a remarkable new beginning. They anoint themselves with orange tanning oil and perform bodybuilding routines to the sounds of Western rock. A crowd could only applaud like this for something like this. In a town like this, Lubertsy, a rough, tough suburb 12 miles from Moscow, an industrial, working class kind of town. If Archie Bunker had been born a communist, he could have lived in Lubertsy. The problem is that Lubertsy's image has recently turned violent. In fact, in Moscow now, the very word Lubers means street gang. This preoccupation with bodybuilding has earned the Lubers a bad reputation. According to sensational articles in the Soviet press, every Friday and Saturday night, bands of Lubers go into Moscow to beat up punks and hippies, anyone who shows themselves to be under the influence of Western culture. There are Soviet punks and hippies. There are leather-wearing, heavy metal fans the Russians call the metalists. These are the people who see Lubers as the enemy. Sergei Troitsky is a medalist. In the more open Soviet Union, Sergei no longer fears the police, he fears the Lubers. 
During the concerts, the guys from Lubritzi arrived. There were about three to four hundred people. They started huge fights, cracked people's skulls, broke their arms and legs. In one word, horrible things go on. In Lubertsy, they deny the town is the source of anti-Western gang violence. They blame this reputation on a new sensational Soviet press. They see themselves as the Soviet Union's first victims of glasnost. There are hooligans in any city, and there are hooligans in Lubertsy too. 15 and 16 year olds sometimes start the trouble, but that doesn't mean they're from Lupertsy. They may say that they're from Lupertsy because it gives them more clout. They'd say, uh, we're from Lupertsy, just to seem more important. There is some truth to Lupertsy's complaint. At an outdoor disco in Moscow's Gorky Park, this group of dancing teenage girls called themselves Lubers. The boys dancing in the bleachers were louvers. As if calling yourself a louver has become the calling card for any 15-year-old who needs to sound tough. You were from Louvertsy? Da. Louvertsy, da. But we also found louvers near Gorky Park who weren't nearly so innocent. There are bands of teenagers out looking for fights with medalists. They see the medalists as Western threats to the Soviet way of life. They wear chains and bracelets with spikes that big. It's not decent. Who needs all that in the Soviet Union? All those hairdos. It's incomprehensible. But we Lubers, we're straight. We want to free Moscow from people like that. <laughs> They're useless. These guys ran by us just a minute ago saying, down with metalists, down with punkers. In other words, down with anything Western. But this woman is confronting them. But why fight? To teach them a lesson. Why did you decide that you had the right to change them? Do you think they'll listen to you? Why did you decide to do this yourself? Up with Lubitsy and all the gangs. Up with Moscow and all the normal people. The irony here is that the Lubers and the medalists have something essential in common. Both iron pumping and heavy metal music used to be underground activities, scorned as too self-oriented and decadent to fit in a socialist society. The Lubers and the metalists are giving the Soviet Union a lesson in freedom. Now that they are free to exist, they are also free to collide. This portion of the Soviet Union, Seven Days in May, is sponsored by Merrill Lynch. At Merrill Lynch, we believe your world should know no boundaries. To know no boundaries, to let yourself run free. To know no boundaries is what the world should be. Investment opportunities. Merrill Lynch is there with the help you need to make the most of them. Because at Merrill Lynch, we believe your world should know no boundaries. It's a question of taste. If you had your pick of two cereals, both with 100% nutrition, would you pick the one with just one kind of flake? Or Kellogg's Just Right with three different kinds of flakes, plus hearty rolled oats, plump raisins, sweet juicy dates, and crisp crunchy nuts? You're not alone. Three out of four people pick Just Right over every other high vitamin cereal. There was no question of nutrition. It was simply a question of taste. Kellogg's Just Right with fruit or whole grain. Get your spaghetti ready. Get ready for a new Ragu Thick and Hearty Spaghetti Sauce. Our thickest, heartiest sauce ever. Made with lots of plump, juicy tomatoes. Special seasonings and spices for a zesty, full-body tomato taste. Now your spaghetti's ready. 
New Ragu Thick and Hearty, our thickest, heartiest sauce ever. Morning on Soviet Minesweeper 375. <laughs> Lieutenant Victor Pushin is ready to greet his crew. <laughs> we asked for a glimpse of what it's like on a Soviet warship. This is what we got. Ten men on a ship built to seek out and destroy harbor mines left over from World War II. But this is serious glasnost for the Soviet Navy. After decades of secrecy and suspicion, it's the first time Western journalists have been on board a Soviet warship of any kind with a camera. Yes. A few observations. On a typical day, these men wouldn't be wearing their dress blues. Yes. The equipment on the ship is old and would be obsolete in many navies. The Soviet Navy eats well usually without the linen tablecloth. This is an exercise. These are emergency drills. They've been doing these for our benefit, showing us what the ship can do. And they're 10 very well-rehearsed men. The Admiral was here yesterday to make sure everything checked out. And that includes the paint they've just put all over this ship in the last few days. You can see some of the paint still sticking to the shoes of the sailors. In fact, there's so much paint on this ship, it would probably sink if it weren't tied to the pier. The pier itself has been painted. It's difficult to say how efficient this crew is because they aren't taking the ship out to sea. But it is known that because the Soviet Navy relies heavily on young, inexperienced men, it has problems. The living quarters are down here. They're very cramped on a ship like this. They also serve as the place where the sailors get their weekly political lesson. Every Soviet ship has a political officer, a Zampolit. In a Western Navy, he'd be the chaplain. Only here, the religion is communism, Leninism, and the motherland. And the Bible is the collected works of Lenin. Comrade, commander, the crew has been assembled for the political lesson. OK, comrades, uh, today's political lecture will deal with two topics. V.I. Lenin on friendship and then related materials of the 27th Communist Party Congress. They're told about Gorbachev's arms proposals here, that the Soviets are peacemakers, that the U.S. is reluctant to disarm. Can you guarantee that the U.S. won't attack us tomorrow? If so, let's saw the ship in half and I'll find another job. These men had no choice about serving in the Navy. The crew on this ship, like the crews on all Soviet ships, is composed of draftees. And many of them come from the Soviet heartland, where patriotism is expected to be stronger, an area where they're further away from Western influence and Western propaganda. I wouldn't consider myself a real man if I didn't do my service in the Navy. Also, military service is a sacred duty. Lieutenant Pushin lives off base in this Leningrad apartment building at number 12 Grumov Street. It's a two-bedroom place, which he shares with his wife, their newborn son, his mother, and his niece. <laughs> Lieutenant Pushin's mother, Anna, is the real head of the household. She survived the siege of Leningrad in World War II. What do you think about your son being in the military? No, oh, I'm very pleased. Oh, I'm very pleased with that. Yeah. Why? So he could any time defend us from invasion. If, if it comes, where would it come from? I can't be sure, but I think that it will probably be you. That night, Lieutenant Pushin and his wife were given tickets to the Kirov Theater, a rare opportunity for them, no doubt arranged for our benefit and under the ever-present supervision of a senior political officer. On stage, Peter the Great, a new opera with more references to perestroika than a Gorbachev speech. Shai, 
What the Soviet Navy gave us was a show, but it wasn't all song and dance. There was a message, too. They would like us to believe and seem eager to prove that their country, which spends a massive amount of its resources to arm itself against the West, really wants better relations with America. Old Moscow. But new times. Tell me honestly, any difference in the supply of vegetables between yesterday and today? Well, everything's all right. I'd just like to see more people. Around. I'm not asking you about the people, but the supply of food. It's almost always like this. Oh, no. No, no. Every day, there'll be an inspection by the city party committee. So just let the managers try to have fewer supplies and get away with it. Meet Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin, Gorbachev's man in Moscow the powerful head of the city's all-powerful Communist Party. He's a tough-talking, tennis-playing, thoroughly modern Marxist. At 56, one of the young firebrands. He also has a lot of nerve, nerve enough to be the first Politburo member ever to show an American news crew around his office. We try to organize it so all the phones will not uh, ring simultaneously here. Only one line comes in here directly. Is that what I think it is? <laughs> Go ahead, read it. The name on the direct line says it all. Gorbachev. It's been a year and a half since this outsider, a construction worker from the Ural Mountains, showed up in Moscow's fast lane. He became a one-man SWAT team at food markets, denouncing the poor quality. He saw whole families wedged into tiny apartments while housing officials were lining their pockets. And one day, when he decided to see how the buses worked, he discovered that a lot of them weren't operating, and the ones that were were packed like sardine cans. After two hours of riding around the city of Moscow, he said, no wonder nobody wants to come to work. What would have happened to you during the Brezhnev era if you had said the things you were saying now? For brave expressions, I could have been fired. I would lose my job quite possibly. For sure. His first few months in office, 84 party officials were fired, hundreds of food store managers were arrested, and the head of the fanciest food store was found guilty of gross corruption and executed. Do you ever worry that maybe you'll go too far? These thoughts do occur. Where does most of the opposition come from? Does it come from the bureaucracy, or is there, is there opposition in the Politburo itself? I would say, indisputably, there is no organized opposition. There are some people who don't support Reconstruction. The ones who have been forced to work hard. The Reconstruction may have chased them from their cozy, comfortable chairs, forced them to think faster, more creatively. If the guy is idle, if the guy is a bum, he's not going to be for reconstruction. Yeltsin may be right that the opposition isn't organized, but it does exist even within the government, where some of his colleagues are convinced that once you unleash a force like Lasnost, you lose control. Yeltsin makes it clear that the Communist Party is not about to lose control. The intellectuals have wondered how far Glasnost will really let them go. From now on, can they really write anything they want to write? The first phase is behind them. They criticized everybody and everything. What does it mean? Does it mean he can publish? Write anything that comes to mind? That is not freedom. That is anarchy. There will be no limitation on talented works, but there will be limitations for rubbish. The rubbish will be forbidden from publication. Nobody needs rubbish. We are reconstructing slowly, and we are reconstructing with you. 
Let's take responsibility on ourselves. Americans still remember Mr. Khrushchev saying, we will bury you. Do you still believe it? Nobody is saying that now. It's difficult for all of us. Not everything works now. There are shortcomings, and lots of things are not working. He's like any local ward politician on a Saturday afternoon. The surprising thing is, the people here don't seem to be afraid to complain to him that the cabbages are too small or the tomatoes are too expensive. You welcome the criticism. Even of you. Certainly. Certainly, I welcome <laughs> You don't seem too sure. <laughs> well, I grew up in the past, in an era of stagnation. And in a time when that kind of thing wasn't evident, I was kind of an accomplice of the time. And so, and so I need to reconstruct myself also. And to say today that I love criticism like I love a woman would be nonsense. I am worried. I don't like it. I need to learn to live. And everyone has to learn how to live in a time of criticism and self-criticism under the conditions of that kind of democracy. We have forgotten how to live under such conditions. And you're happier because you can criticize? Yes, it is necessary. It is right. The working man has to be able to share in the openness. Yeltsin's been out on the streets hundreds of times. This day at Romniki Corpus, a new residential community in the south of Moscow. Five hours, seven stops, and seven free-form gripe sessions. Why don't you buy the meat? Don't you usually have meat? You consider this meat? It's fat and bones. Look, it's all bones in this package. I'm not a housewife, but if I was a housewife, why would I buy this? Why are people complaining about how the meat is cut? You're a specialist. Well, look, isn't this good meat? Well, I don't know. You're the specialist, not me. People are complaining. So we decided to come back today, five days after Yeltsin was here, to see how the meat counter looked. There was some meat here when we arrived, but we weren't allowed to take pictures until they brought out several trays more. And I guess for Americans, the question always comes back to this. They can't believe that at some point, you don't sit in the privacy of your room and look at America and the Western nations and say, capitalism may be selfish and it may be unequal, but it works. Perhaps I thought about it. Have you? Of course. Of course I think about it. And that's what makes a new leader like Boris Yeltsin at first seem so seductive. The words are the ones Westerners love to hear. Reasonable words and familiar ones like openness, criticism, democracy. What do you say to those Americans who think glasnost is the beginning of the Soviet Union's recognition that socialism was a mistake. I have pity on them. They are misguided. In time, they will have to backtrack and change their views. I'm confident of that. So Westerners have to remember Glasnost is just a means to an end. And the end is no different than before. It started over two decades ago. The finest varietal grapes were planted. The world's most costly vineyards. The harvest begins in the Napa Sonoma growing regions. The greatest winemaking facilities in the world. Cork from Portugal. Oak cellars. Gallo's first vintage dated wines. Acclaim. In just 20 short years, the maker of America's most popular wine has become America's most honored winery.
today's gallop. All the best Hawaiian can be. Freedom. It's becoming what you want to be. Doing what you want to do. Involving yourself in what you value most. Merrill Lynch can help you achieve that freedom. We believe the client always comes first. So we can help you find the best choices from our world of opportunities. Because at Merrill Lynch, we believe your world should know no boundaries. Are you still collecting the same old stuff? We'll start something new with stamps. Especially now with our new American Wildlife Issue. 50 beautifully detailed animal, bird, reptile, and insect stamps. Each commemorating America's natural wildlife heritage. Now at your post office. And remember, unlike some things, once you collect stamps, you can enjoy their beauty forever. This CBS News special will continue. Thursday, he had the world in the palm of his hand. I want this fight just one more. Now, to keep his dream alive, he has to face his worst nightmare. What you want? Go for it. Sylvester Stallone, Talia Shire, Burgess Meredith, Carl Weathers, and Mr. T star in Rocky III, Thursday. This is CBS. Thanks to me and Factory Incentives, you Isuzu dealers can now offer some truly incredible deals. The Isuzu Pup, America's lowest priced import truck, now only $3. The Impulse and Trooper 2 also come with Factory Incentives, like a comprehensive dental plan. And for the first 10,000 customers, we'll throw in a free chauffeur. You have my word on it. Very good. Hurry, for a limited time, you can save big at your participating Isuzu dealer. Truly. The low price revolution is on at Winn Dixie. You'll see the change down every aisle, in every department. Now your money goes further because we've lowered prices. Lower than ever before. Now we give you low prices nobody can beat. Nobody. Landing a parking crisis tonight. The Soviets take a lot of things seriously, including sports, and they don't let the weather get in the way. Today, it's raining. Temperature's down in the 40s. It's cold out here. Yet, at this enormous outdoor swimming pool in the middle of Moscow, well, take a look. Now, the other day, it was sunny, warm, temperature in the high 70s, low 80s. A perfect day for this. You'd think these kids would be so grateful when winter finally ends around here, they'd be happy to put their skis away for a while. But they'd rather get a jump on the competition. So with the help of some straw mats to slide on and pine needles to land in, they're off. These boys told us they'd like to become champions so they can compete in America. A country they know about from Soviet television. Homeless people. Homeless people. There are many homeless people. Terrorists. There are many terrorists. They have elections where blacks aren't allowed to vote. Only whites. And not all of them. They hate blacks. They treat them like animals, not people. If that's what you've seen on TV, why do you want to go there? We think there are cities where there are good people and no fighting. It's as if his philosophy were etched in stone, just like the old man himself. The press, Vladimir Lenin said, is the sharpest weapon of the Communist Party. Uh, 
Tesla, a television station in Tbilisi in the Soviet Republic of Georgia. His name is Tengi Suljanishvili, a reporter whose stories run on the Soviet Union's version of the National Evening News. In this electronic age of information, a TV reporter in the Soviet Union with his minicam crew looks like a TV reporter any place in the United States. But in the Soviet Union, historically, news was what the government wanted it to be, and bad news was usually off limits, unless, of course, it happened someplace else. Just listen to this. Disasters that happened, for instance, in the mountains of Soviet Georgia were never reported here, because all earthquakes, all fires, all disasters happened only in the United States. That's why when Tengiz was allowed to file this report a few months ago, it was, in its own way, extraordinary. A story about an avalanche killing 100 people in the mountains. Historically, the Soviet people have been kept in the dark. So now that Gorbachev has said, let there be light, how much light can there really be? This is an example of the importance of glasnost. Before it was rare that we could show a report like this on television, like a natural disaster, river floods or avalanches. And we never mentioned death, the people killed in these disasters. Now we can put it on television, on the local news as well as nationwide. Do, do you do the shopping for the family? Normally? In the afternoon, we go to the market. Who does the dishes? Well, I don't know who does it, but I don't do that. <laughs> it's magic. It just gets cleaned by magic. <laughs> The contradictions leap out at you in a place like this. How can a country have 19th century marketplaces and 21st century missiles at the same time? For the record, the Soviet authorities let us go any place we wanted and shoot anything we wanted. But when we came across these school children, we had to wonder, what kind of new openness should anyone really expect from a people indoctrinated from kindergarten? That the state comes first, that individualism, especially in children, is practically a crime. And what should they expect from television, today's most powerful weapon of the Communist Party, in Gorbachev's brave new world? We, we Americans think that if you criticize the wrong person too harshly, Siberia. It's a stereotype. But let me explain it this way. I know about 10,000 anecdotes and jokes, political jokes, and I've told my jokes everywhere. Yet I've been sent to Siberia only once. My television station sent me there to do a story about the Siberian Railroad. So, is there a new openness in the Soviet press and television? The answer is definitely yes. But let's not forget that in the Soviet Union, the press is not a watchdog of government. It's a part of government, a tool of government. So the jury is still out on what will happen to the first Soviet reporter who puts Glasnost to the real test, who digs too deeply into the wrong area, who criticizes too harshly the wrong people. That's when we, and more importantly, the Soviet people will learn how much openness is too much openness. After all, what the state giveth, the state can just as easily taketh away. Uh, yeah. Do you talk about Glasnost at all on this program? No, not this time. It's a kind of a magazine. Mm -hmm. It's not 60 minutes, but it is certainly 45 minutes. <laughs> Meet the man who carries Gorbachev's message to the world. He is Gennady Gerasimov. <laughs>
official spokesman for the Soviet foreign ministry, and by far the Soviet's most effective image maker. And over there is a new American embassy building. Mm. Full of, <laughs> full of bugs, they say. They say. They say. They say. Then you say? They, they haven't found any. Uh. They didn't produce any evidence. They say the whole thing is a bug. <laughs> Maybe. Uh. <laughs> a maverick, not in the least. This is the most interesting book I've read recently. World Have Weapon read Database? No, I say yeah, I'm missing one. Soviet missiles. Mm -hmm. The whole volume is Soviet missiles? You guys you have a lot. how many of them we have. You guys have a lot of missiles. Yes. There's a lot to disarm, huh? Yes, and we are ready to disarm, as you know. Anytime. Any, anytime on reciprocal basis. <laughs> We're spending billions and billions of dollars on both sides for weapons. We are ready to stop it tomorrow. You, you look at, you look at, you've been to Japan? Five times. You look at the way, the level of living, the standard of living. I always it, cite Japan as an example. In a country like Japan where they don't spend that kind of money on weapons. Mm -hmm. They're wiser. Look at Switzerland. They're even more wiser. They don't fight. Do you hear a debate in the Soviet Union today about your presence, your military presence in Afghanistan? Do people talk about it of on television, on your program, for example? Of course they talk about Afghanistan, but on TV they talk about the terms of withdrawal. Do you have, for example, when the United States was in Vietnam, you had a range of opinion from people who said, bomb Hanoi, to people who said, we have no right to be in that country. And you heard that opinion on television, radio, you saw it in the press virtually every day. Do you have that kind of debate over Afghanistan? I am sure we have it uh, in private. But you said in private. What about in, in public? Private. In public, we talk about uh, the terms of withdrawal from Afghanistan. But you see, it, it, as I see it, this is a fundamental difference between our two yes, countries. Yes. You have that debate in private. We had that debate in public. We have now debate in public on many controversial issues which were not discussed two years ago. We are still a little bit shy in the field of foreign policy. Gerasimov spent five years in New York as a columnist for the Soviet press. No Soviet official is said to be more familiar with America than he is. We have what we call the American dream. People can be... What, what is the dream? The people can be... People can make it. People can be born... But here can also make people it. can be born into poverty. They can escape poverty. They can attain in a material sense. Suppose, right? suppose you live in South Bronx. Can you escape poverty in South Bronx? I have read many articles written by your journalists that it's next to impossible to, es to escape this circle of poverty. But it is possible. Next listen, to impossible. Listen, I grew up in poverty. You made no, it? No one in my family had gone to college. My mother never made more than $35 a week during her working lifetime. Did you prove yet, nothing? Yet it, it, it proves that the American I, I, dream is I possible. I can tell you my own story. It's almost but, the same. Right, listen, Why? There is, a, there is a large gap between Why the rich and poor. Why are saying that blacks are second-class citizens? Because in many cases they are. They are. Why? That's it's the nature. of opportunity. Listen, does it say anything to you that there's a long waiting line to get into the United States and a real short line to get into here? What because does that say to you? It says to me that uh, your country has the reputation of the land of opportunity and those who are industrious enough can make it. But the ideal is to make money to get rich in your rat race. Do we have something to learn from each other? Of course we do. What can we learn from you? How to do away with slums and we want to learn from you how to do away with lines. With? Lines. What else can we learn? Well, I would like uh, for our workers to learn to work as hard as your workers do. One of the reasons that you have more and better goods is that we do not work hard. It's that simple. Why? I lived in the States and when we had our apartment repainted, it took uh, one worker one day. He came completely equipped and repainted the whole thing. And here there will be three or four people walking around for a week. So this is what I want to learn from you. And, and what... American enterprise. And, and what do we need to learn from the Soviet people? 
Well, maybe you need a little bit of a more philosophical approach to life. Because your philosophy is the philosophy of success. And success only in terms of uh, money which you can get by the, when you are involved in this rat race. You have more stress in your society, more tension in your society. It is more cold, it's less sympathy between the people because people are in this rat race and they're competitors which gives an overall effect that you are better off overall, maybe, because the productivity is higher. Here we take everything in a more relaxed way and we pay for it. Americans are breaking the boundaries of age as never before. And at Merrill Lynch, our expertise in retirement planning can help you get more out of life. And our financial consultants can show you more ways to help assure your future. Because at Merrill Lynch, we believe your world should know no boundaries. For all those confrontations with the unpredictable, BMW introduces the ultimate defense, the 535i. With an amazingly agile suspension, a computer-controlled engine that constantly adjusts to changing driving conditions, and an ingenious anti-lock braking system. The 535i, it lets those who take driving seriously peacefully coexist with those who don't. Mom's magic meatloaf is weighing on you like a ton of bricks. Bubbles of Alka-Seltzer to the rescue, because speed is what you need to lift the heaviness off your stomach and relieve your heartburn and pounding headache fast. So for fast relief, let the bubbles rise to the occasion. Alka-Seltzer to the rescue. Try new extra strength Alka-Seltzer. More of what you take Alka-Seltzer for. Another day is turned to night. Close your eyes, say goodnight. Sweet dreams are on their way All is well as you end the day Sleep safe, sweet dreams, good night Salmon X2 has the one sleep ingredient doctors recommend most to help you fall asleep safely without worry Salmon X2 Good night American Vision World View understand the nation and to know the world. To see the truth and report it plainly. That is the purpose and the promise of CBS News. Good evening from CBS News. This is Newsbreak. Oliver North finally has agreed to testify before Congress on his role in the Iran-Contra scandal. The former White House aide will take the stand July 7. A federal grand jury has charged Chrysler with selling, as new, more than 60,000 cars driven by company managers with the odometers disconnected. The indictment says some of the cars were in accidents, repaired, then sold as new. One word distinguishes the American Express card from the others. Member. And now you can apply for membership over the phone. Just call 1-800-THE-CARD. The IRS is going to crack down on kids under 14 who make more than $1,000 in investment income. Beginning this year, they'll have to file a return and pay tax on any interest over a grand. I'm Terrence Smith, CBS News, Washington. The Soviet Union, seven days in May, will continue in a moment. This is CBS. From the farm to the public's dairy, all the way to your table. Quality and freshness come from Publix. In pure dairy products, like Publix Premium Ice Cream, enjoy the rich taste of 16 delicious flavors. This week, a half gallon is just $2.19. The Publix Dairy, that's where the quality comes from. Sounds like thunder and moves like lightning.
And when it's over, you head for the mountains. Push. Head for the beer that always goes down smooth as a mountain stream. The pit bull controversy hits home tonight at 11. The Soviet Union, seven days in May, continues. These are some of the smallest recipients of Soviet health care. This is a society where husbands are banned from the delivery room. But as part of the new openness, the Soviets agreed to give us a rare look inside at the birth of a baby here. Said one doctor shaking his head, if you were Soviet TV asking, we'd kick your butts right out of here. Other women in labor are in the delivery room. They wait their turn and they watch. Soulmate witnesses to the birth of Valerie Makarashvili in maternity hospital number four in Tbilisi, Georgia. As part of Glasnost, the Kremlin has been publicly criticizing Soviet health care, particularly maternity hospitals, which are said to be unsanitary. Infant mortality is on the rise, but the hospitals we were shown looked clean and the doctors seemed attentive. We came here expecting Soviet medicine to be primitive as in the third world, but boy, were we surprised. What we saw may be the best health care the Soviet Union has to offer. Tamori Chachkiani, a surgeon, prepares to take a biopsy of his patient's lungs. At least in big city hospitals like this cancer institute in Tbilisi, they use up-to-date anesthesia and accepted Western techniques. The examination is finished. Tamori's wife, Marika, is a doctor too, a cardiologist. Each morning they drive their children to school, Vaniko 12, Lika 11, and four-year-old Georgi, who spends all day at a daycare center, free of charge. <laughs> there are more women doctors in the Soviet Union than men, but generally they are the ones with the least training and they're paid less. Marika earns 120 rubles a month, less than $200. Her husband makes twice as much. This is where Marika works, an emergency cardiac care unit where there appears to be no shortage of doctors, nurses, and orderlies. Right now, there are three patients here, but there are five doctors and many more nearby. By U.S. standards, this is an overstaffed facility. So doctors end up doing chores computers do in U.S. hospitals. Here we saw old and new methods side by side, an antiquated oxygen tank alongside contemporary electrocardiogram monitors, an expensive high-tech echo scanner, and a laser therapy gadget described as witchcraft by an American doctor. From what we saw at five different facilities, the Soviets are spending millions of dollars on foreign-made medical equipment. We saw some very sophisticated, computerized, state-of-the-art devices. But sometimes doctors can't figure out how to operate the complicated hardware, and frequently the fancy machines break down. Tell me, why we can't send this back to the manufacturer and have them send you we a new... We asked them, but uh, this firm... Which firm um, is this? It is uh, Honeywell. 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 Yes. It was one of the last models. One of the last see, models. So we were, we were unlucky maybe with him. Maybe he will help us <laughs> to change our... <laughs> Heart disease is on the rise in the Soviet Union, where the diet is high cholesterol and high alcohol. A campaign is underway to encourage better diets and more exercise. They even have their own Jane Fonda. Tamori's mother and father live with them. Lily was a pediatrician who retired early to take care of her grandchildren. Free live-in childcare. Grandfather Vano, a dermatologist, sometimes sees private patients at home, but mostly he works at a clinic. We're here at a polyclinic, which is the first stop or the bedrock of the people's medicine, the Soviet health care system. It's sort of like a neighborhood outpatient clinic in the States, except these polyclinics have come under blistering attacks lately in the Soviet press for sloppiness and low standards. 
Vano, the skin doctor, works six hours a day from nine to three without a break. His nurse draws blood with needles much thicker than the ones we use, and nothing in Vano's clinic or anywhere in Soviet medicine is disposable. As they used to be in the U.S. over 20 years ago, the needles are washed and dropped in boiling water. The clinic has its own pharmacy where prescriptions are made to order in less than purified conditions. In the U.S., all this is done by machine. The Soviets will sometimes admit that their medicine is behind, but they argue at least it's free and...